Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Thursday, October 3rd, 2024. All right, the first story at the top of antiwar.com today, Israel is planning a major attack on Iran. So Israel is planning to launch a significant retaliation attack against Iran over the Iranian missile barrage that targeted Israel on Tuesday, which was a response to several Israeli escalations in the region. Israeli officials acknowledged to Axios that the situation could lead to a full-blown regional war which would involve the U.S. According to the Axios report, Israel could target oil production facilities inside Iran or other strategic sites. Israeli officials say that if Iran hits back, then all options will be on the table, including strikes on Iran's civilian nuclear facilities. An Israeli official told Axios, quote, We have a big question mark about how the Iranians are going to respond to an attack, but we take into consideration the possibility the possibility that they would go all in, which will be a whole different ball game. End quote. So other options being considered are attacks on Iran's air defenses or targeted assassinations. And Israel has a history, a long history of carrying out covert assassinations inside Iran. Uh, most recently, of course, was the assassination of Ismail Haniyeh, Hamas's political leader who was killed in Tehran. Israel would likely need U.S. military support to launch significant strikes on Iranian territory, and the U.S. officials who spoke with Axios say they are coordinating with the Biden administration. Sorry, the Israeli officials speaking to Axios say that they are coordinating with the Biden administration. Israel wants more U.S. US support if it provokes another Iranian attack, so they want the U.S. to defend them, help defend them again. Um, As I covered yesterday, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said Tuesday that the U.S. would work with Israel to ensure Iran faces severe consequences. President Biden has also said that he is working with Israel on a response, but said Wednesday that he would not support strikes on Iran's nuclear facility. Um, So he said that doesn't really matter what Biden says. I mean, the other day he said that he's not going to send more troops to the Middle East, and the next day his Pentagon announced that they were sending a few thousand troops to the Middle East. But either way, you know, going back to what the Israeli officials were saying, they're not. it sounds like they're not saying they plan to target the nuclear facilities right away. It seems like they're saying if they attack Iran and then Iran attacks again, then they're going to really go hard and, and hit nuclear facilities and things like that. So it kind of sounds like, Israel is preparing for full-blown war here, like they want to poke Iran just hard enough to provoke another attack, get more support from Congress, from the U.S., maybe get a few more billion dollars, um, and then really go go all out with U.S. support. Um, So it's just a very precarious situation. But Biden said this on Wednesday. He said, quote, All seven of us agree that they have a right to respond, but they have to respond proportionally, end quote. So he said all seven of us. He's referring to the group of seven. He just he just had some kind of meeting with them. And apparently they agreed to impose new sanctions on Iran. But I mean, Iran is under so many sanctions that it's not going to make a difference. Um, So Israel acknowledged on Wednesday that Iranian missiles made an impact on several military bases, but claimed that there was no significant damage. But if you look at the pictures here, uh, this is the Times of Israel. I mean, that's some pretty serious damage there. Um, You know, there's some pictures of what looks like pretty heavy damage. Uh, But Israel is claiming, oh, you know, it wasn't a big deal, uh, didn't affect our military force. Um, but they certainly uh, made an impact and uh, got through the air defenses. Um, uh, so uh, where was I here? Uh, Israel's also claiming that there were no casualties, no major casualties, with only two Israelis suffering minor injuries, and there was a Palestinian killed in the Israeli-occupied West Bank who was hit with shrapnel from an intercepted missile. Um, so, all right. And then I just mentioned at the end that, you know, the Iranian attack— 
was a response to the killing of Haniye, uh, the killing of Nasrallah, and an IRGC guard who was killed alongside him. Um, that's what the IRGC named specifically when they announced that the attack. All right, so the next one here. So again, sorry to backtrack again. It's just we're, we are in a very hairy situation right now. As I was saying yesterday, I wouldn't be surprised if some sort of attack really it could happen at any moment, it seems like. Um, all right, the next one here. Israeli airstrike kills three civilians in residential area of Damascus. This article is from Jason Ditt. So Israel carried out more airstrikes in Damascus against the neighborhood uh, called Meza. Um, and this was on Wednesday. And at least three civilians were among the killed. And uh, and the same, uh, the strikes hit a residential building. A day earlier, uh, they also killed three civilians in this same neighborhood, including that news anchor. Um, so details are still emerging. Israeli media is claiming that the residential neighborhood was frequented by Hezbollah and Iran's Revolutionary Guards. Um, two of the three slain civilians were said to be non-Syrians. So they continue to bomb Syria and kill civilians. <clears throat> All right. So the next one here, Lebanon says that Nasrallah agreed to a ceasefire before he was killed. So Lebanese Foreign Minister Abdallah Bou Habib has said that Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah agreed to a U.S. and French proposed 21-day ceasefire with Israel right before Israel killed him. So Habib said the U.S. and France told Lebanon that Netanyahu also agreed to the ceasefire proposal. Um, he said in an interview, quote, they told us that Mr. Netanyahu agreed on this, and so we also got the agreement of Hezbollah on that. And you know what happened since then, end quote, basically saying, you know the rest of the story, then they kill Nasrallah. So if you look at the timeline here, um, on September 25th, which was last Wednesday, the U.S., France, and several other countries released a joint statement calling for an immediate 21-day ceasefire in Lebanon to give time to reach a diplomatic solution to the situation on the Israel-Lebanon border. The following day, Netanyahu arrived in New York for the U.N. General Assembly and rejected rumors that Israel agreed to the truce. Um, but he is saying that the U.S., and, and this is we saw this in media reports, U.S. officials saying, oh, Israel agreed uh, even after Netanyahu rejected it. U.S. officials told the Times of Israel or um, some other media outlets that they coordinated the ceasefire proposal with Israel and that Israel had agreed and that they were so frustrated with Netanyahu that he, you know, this is just the same story we've been hearing for the past year related to a, a, a ceasefire in Gaza. Now the same story in Lebanon. They're just um, acting like they're powerless here. On that same day that Netanyahu rejected the ceasefire, Israel said it got $8.7 billion in new military aid from the U.S. So, I mean, they again, they just weren't putting any real pressure on him. But so this is uh, this this comment from Lebanon's foreign minister, I mean, is significant if Nasrallah actually agreed to a ceasefire right before he killed him. Now, um, there's also I, some people, I shared a clip of the, the news interview on Twitter and a lot of people are saying, oh, Hezbollah wouldn't have agreed to a ceasefire without a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, I think that's that's, you know, uh, that's true that that's been their position throughout this whole thing. Um, but I think it's possible because this was a 21 day ceasefire. And during that time, the idea was to negotiate a diplomatic solution. And Hezbollah could have made the you know condition for a ceasefire in Gaza. And for all we know, the U.S. could have been telling them that. I think that's what they were saying, that the idea was ceasefire and we're going to try to get a, a you know ceasefire in Lebanon. We're going to try to negotiate a deal and get a Gaza ceasefire deal. So that, that might have been what the U.S. was saying. Um, but either way, I mean, th there's no reason to take the U.S. seriously anymore when it comes to these negotiations. But we'll see if there's any kind of confirmation or denial from Hezbollah that he did agree to the ceasefire before being killed. And this is certainly Israel's style here to kill someone uh, who's considering a ceasefire or considering uh, some sort of peace. Um, and Israeli officials actually said that they decided to kill Nasrallah because he would not negotiate a diplomatic solution without a ceasefire in Gaza. 
All right, our sponsor for today's show is the Expat Money Summit. So this is starting next week, October 7th to the 11th. This will be held online. This is being put on by Mikkel Thorup, who's a highly sought after expat consultant. And at this summit, you'll learn all sorts of things about the expat lifestyle. It's good for people who are already expats or if you're considering moving out of the country, even if you're just curious about it. There's also going to be lots of geopolitics stuff since that's very important to people who want to move around the world and live in different places. Um, So if you want to get your free ticket, you go to expatmoneysummit.com and put in your email. If you want a VIP ticket, I want to show you some of the uh, VIP panels that they have. I will be joining uh, one of them, World War III, Fear Mongering or Genuine Concern. That's featuring me, Kyle Anzalone of Antiwar.com, and Hrove Moric. Uh, he has the Geopolitics and Empires podcast, great podcast. Um, so we'll be doing that. Also a VIP panel about de-dollarization, one about fortifying digital frontiers, um, and a few others here. So lots of good stuff. Confirmed speakers include Dr. Ron Paul, Doug Casey, Mark Faber, Tom Woods, Scott Horton, Tom Luongo, and there are many others. So this is a big event. Definitely go reserve a ticket, even if you you just want to check out one day or there's one speaker. um, You know, it doesn't hurt to get the ticket. And then there's lots of content that you will be able to enjoy. So again, expatmoneysummit.com. Or if you want the VIP, go through the link in the description or put in the code anti-war on the website. All right, back to the news here. Israeli airstrikes in Lebanon kill at least 46. So the Lebanese health ministry has said that Israeli airstrikes in Lebanon on Wednesday killed at least 46 people and wounded 85. Um, They put this update out uh, just after midnight, early Thursday morning in uh, Beirut. So the death toll since Israel escalated things in September has surpassed 1,400, 1,400 people have been killed in Lebanon. That includes many civilians. We don't know the exact breakdown, um, but, and the Lebanese government said Wednesday that 1.2 million people have been displaced. So a huge displacement crisis. A lot of people have gone into Syria, um, really bad situation for the, you know, civilians on the ground. Um, You see the aftermath of this airstrike in Beirut, uh, in the Southern suburbs there just completely obliterating uh, residential buildings, very similar to what they've done to Gaza. And the Israeli strikes on Wednesday hit hit across the country in the south and the east, and they hit Beirut. And they're actually expanding their strikes outside of Dahia, which is the southern suburb. Well, you know, that's where the it's a majority Shiite population that they usually strike. Um, early Thursday, Israeli strikes hit central Beirut, killing at least six people. And apparently this strike was near Lebanon's parliament. So they're getting close to where the government uh, is based. Um, so just uh, they're really keeping up these strikes. All right. So the next one here, at least eight Israeli troops killed in clashes with Hezbollah. So there's definitely fighting going on on the ground now. Israel said Wednesday that eight of its soldiers have been killed fighting Hezbollah on the ground in South Lebanon as the Israeli invasion is underway. The IDF said the troops were killed in a gun battle with Hezbollah in a village in southern Lebanon. The Israeli soldiers were commandos in the elite Agaz unit, and their squad commander was among those killed. Um, The Israeli military said that regular troops and armor divisions would be joining the commandos in the fight in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah said that its forces destroyed three Israeli tanks near Maroon El Ras, a Lebanese town just one kilometer from the Israeli border. Um, And then Hezbollah also said that they killed um, a unit of Israeli military troops that they they said they were in a building and that there was explosive in they detonated explosives that blew up the building and then they fired on them. So uh, if Hezbollah's uh, what they're putting out is true, then there could be more, um, much more than eight Israeli soldiers killed, or there could just be more casualties in general, including wounded soldiers. Um, So Hezbollah said that its forces were able to repel Israeli troops from advancing in other areas of southern Lebanon. So these casualties show, I mean, Hezbollah is is able to still put up um, a a fight here in southern Lebanon, despite all these airstrikes and despite Israel taking out their senior leadership. 
because it doesn't seem like the Israeli troops got very far into southern Lebanon before um, they started facing some serious resistance from Hezbollah. No, I don't have an idea of how many casualties there were on the Hezbollah side when it came to the fighting uh, on the ground. Uh, maybe we'll have a clearer picture on that, but um, it does look like even though they're really decimating Lebanon with the airstrikes, doesn't look like they're going to have an easy time uh, on the ground. Um, and the U.S. has backed Israel's decision to invade. You know, again, we've seen this publicly, this call for diplomacy. But as that Politico report said that I went over yesterday, privately, the U.S. was actually encouraging Israel to escalate in Lebanon. And going back to the earlier story, Lebanon's foreign minister said the idea of the 21-day ceasefire was that there'd be a pause and then Hochstein, uh, President Biden's envoy would go to Lebanon to try to negotiate a deal. Well, that Politico report said that he was one of the officials egging Israel on, uh, essentially g giving them the green light to do all these escalations. Um, so again, not maybe it was not a sincere ceasefire offer from the U.S. I mean, it definitely wasn't from Israel. All right, so the next one here. Uh, Israel escalates in Gaza, slaughters dozens. So it, Israel ramped up its strikes on Gaza overnight, Tuesday into Wednesday, slaughtering dozens of Palestinians. Really violent day in Gaza. Um, Middle East Eye reported that Palestinian medical sources said 79 Palestinians were killed just on Wednesday morning, making it one of the deadliest mornings in Gaza for weeks. Gaza's health ministry said Wednesday that at least 51 Palestinians were killed in the previous 24-hour period. So that's a lower number. But as we know, the health ministry's numbers, they count the bodies brought to the hospitals and morgues. Um, and they also put their count out kind of early in the day. So, um, you know, not all of the, the dead people might not have been brought there or they could have been counting people who were under the rubble in that 79 number. Um, but there was a, very heavy strikes. Um, so the health ministry said that the latest violence brought its recorded death toll since October 7th, 2023 to 41,689. It said another 165 were injured, bringing the total number of wounded to 96,625. And this is another very sad picture. I, I know I mentioned that we, we have a account now with Reuters to get their pictures and, and other um, partners that they have, and there's a, they have a lot of journalists in Gaza, and I look through these pictures every day, and they're always really rough, and this is a woman holding a dead child, you know, wrapped up in the sheet. Um, so this is a daily occurrence, children being killed. Israeli strikes on Wednesday included attacks on Gaza City, which targeted a school and an orphanage that were both sheltering displaced Palestinians. According to Middle East Eye, at least 25 people were killed in the two strikes, including women and children. Israel also, yeah, I kind of breezed over that, but they apparently hit an orphanage um, and, and a school, um, two separate places that they targeted in Gaza City. Israel also ramped up attacks on the southern city of Khan Yunis on Tuesday, and they uh, launched tank raids into the city. Reuters reported that 40 Palestinians and dozens were killed. Sorry, 40 Palestinians were killed and dozens were wounded in those attacks in Khan Yunis. So again, just another, just an incredibly violent day in Gaza, while most of the attention is on Lebanon and the tensions between Israel and Iran. You think of what Israel could get away with if things really turn into the U.S. and Iran shooting at each other. Um, all right, so the next one here, Congress to vote on blocking weapons to Israel. So this article is from Mondo Weiss. I've been meaning to cover this. Uh, Bernie Sanders introduced uh, legislation to block a $20 billion arms sale to Israel. That's the one that the U.S. approved a few weeks ago. Um, and... So apparently they're going to vote on it. And I didn't realize this. According to Mondo Weiss, this is the first time that Congress will be voting to block a weapons to block weapons to Israel. Now, obviously, it's not going to pass. It's probably in the Senate. It's not even going to come remotely close. It'll be interesting to see. Maybe Rand Paul will vote for it, but he hasn't been good on Israel. Um, but um, 
Sanders introduced it. He said in a statement, quote, sadly and illegally, much of the carnage in Gaza has been carried out with U.S. provided military equipment. Providing more offensive weapons to continue this disastrous war would violate U.S. and international law. The sales would reward Netanyahu's extremist government, even as it continues to cause massive destruction in Gaza, undermine a peace deal. Uh, it's a long statement. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but, you know, he's... Uh, uh, doing a good thing here by introducing this legislation. I think it would be great to get a recorded vote on something like this in the Senate. And then, you know, and then on the other hand, Sanders is supporting, uh, I think he's called it a genocide. I don't know. I might be wrong. He might've not used that word, but it's not like AOC who's called what's happening in Gaza, a genocide, and then goes and endorses one of the people helping carry it out. But that is basically what Sanders is doing as well. Um, endorsing, Harris, um, whilst, you know, rightly speaking out against what Israel is doing in Gaza. Uh, all right. So the next one here, Russia says no arms control talks with the U.S. So Russia said on Monday that it was not possible to hold nuclear arms control talks with the U.S. unless Washington changes its highly hostile policies toward Moscow. This is Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova. She said, quote, we see no point in engaging in strategic dialogue with Washington unless it involves comprehensive efforts to reduce overall conflict levels, respects Russia's fundamental interests, and focuses on resolving the fundamental security contradictions created by the U.S. and NATO, end quote. So she made the comments when asked about the possibility of the U.S. and Russia holding talks on a potential treaty to replace New START. And New START is the last arms control treaty between the U.S. and Russia, and it's due to expire in 2026. So this is not good. The state of arms control is it's a very bleak state. Um, and Russia suspended its participation in New START last year. It said it did that in response to a Ukrainian drone attack on a facility housing Russian nuclear weapons. Um and Russia said that the attack was supported by the U.S. and NATO. There was a report in Asia Times that cited NATO sources who said that Ukrainian drones used the U.S. satellite GPS data to hit their targets in that attack. Um, so while Russia suspended its participation in New START, both the U.S. and Russia are still abiding by the limits set by the treaty when it comes to the deployment of nuclear warheads. <coughs> it uh, caps the deployment of nuclear warheads at... 1,550. So I think there's a chance if that when this thing does expire that they could increase the number of deployed nuclear warheads. And another thing Putin has said is that he wants a deal that includes the UK's and France's nuclear arsenals. The UK is actually expanding its nuclear arsenal, um, something that has not gotten much attention in, uh, you know, I believe it was last year, maybe even two years ago at this point when they announced that. Um, so the collapse of New START, this came after the Trump administration pulled out of two other arms control treaties with Russia, the INF Treaty, which banned medium-range land-based missile systems, and the Open Skies Treaty, which allowed unarmed surveillance flights over participating countries. And then you go back to the Bush administration, they pulled out of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. So uh, Russia tried to salvage both of these treaties when Biden came in, the New START and Open Skies. Russia offered basically to restore open skies. Biden said no, even though when Trump pulled out of it, Biden, the presidential candidate, uh, very strongly criticized it. But he came into office. Russia said, hey, let's restore this. And he said no. Um, Russia also offered a moratorium on the deployment of INF range missiles in Europe. And we just saw recently the U.S. say they're going to deploy INF range missiles to Europe to Germany by 2026 and that is something Russia is very unhappy about um, All right, so the next one here vice president debate preemptive strike on Iran now So this is from Kelly Vlahos at responsible statecraft I did not watch the whole vice presidential debate because I, I was told only the first five minutes were foreign policy um, So Kelly gets into that and you know, it's really something the way that they opened it up Margaret Brennan said, um, you know, considering all the horrors that are happening in Gaza, the risk of nuclear war with Russia, um, the escalations in the Middle East, the, the risk of full-blown nuclear war, Margaret Brennan didn't say, what will you do to end this crisis? What will you do to end these horrific wars? She said, um, would you support 
or oppose a preemptive strike by Israel on Iran? That was the question. That was the only foreign policy question. And um, it was not, uh, and that was it. It's just amazing. You know, this is, it. foreign policy is never really a focus at, on presidential, vice presidential debates. But again, considering just the, what's happening right now, you would think there would be more focus on it. Um, so they both kind of, you know, rambled about different things, you know, going after each other about Iran, um, you know, Walsh saying, oh, Trump was weak on Iran and everything. Uh, but essentially they both said that they back whatever Israel, uh, wants to do. Um, and, uh, Vance kind of more explicitly, he went on this whole thing talking about Iran and the, the, uh, Biden administration. And then he, he, at, at the end, I'll just read what he said. He said, quote, now you asked about a preemptive strike, Margaret, and I want to answer the question. Look, it is up to Israel what they think they need to do to keep their country safe. And we should support our allies wherever they are when they're fighting the bad guys. I think that's the right approach to take with the Israel question, end quote. So basically saying it's up to Israel. Now, when the, you know, it kind of makes it sound like it's the Israel just doing everything on their own, but this is a situation that's entirely, you know, the U.S. supports Israel so much. And of course, with the situation now with Biden, they're essentially coordinating on a response. Um, they're, they've defended Israel twice now from Iranian attacks. So, you know, when you say, oh, you know, Israel can do whatever it wants, that means that you're going to, you know, support those actions in some way. Um, so it's not just kind of Israel as is this independent actor. Um, so, again, just really lacking on the on the foreign policy. Um, all right. So the next one here, the last story. This is from the Gray Zone. A leak reveals a covert U.S. plot to destabilize Bangladesh's politics. This is from Kit Clarenberg and Wyatt Reed at the Gray Zone. So the coup that just happened in Bangladesh, the overthrow of Prime Minister Shaikh Hasina. I didn't really follow too much. I saw when she left, she said that the U.S. Uh, was involved in her ouster. And of course, the U.S. is always, you know, has its hands all over the place and um, when a foreign leader says that, you shouldn't just dismiss it out of hand. Um, but now we have some concrete evidence of U.S. involvement in these protests. Um, and it's very strange, like you just the, the different ways that the U.S. meddles in other countries. So I'm just going to read a little bit of this report. It's very long. I would suggest going in and reading it if you want to really get the whole picture. Uh, leaked documents reveal that prior to the toppling of Bangladeshi Prime Minister Shaikh Hasina, the U.S. government-funded International Republican Institute, Institute trained an army of activists, including rappers and LGB, LGBTQI people, even hosting transgender dance performances to achieve a national power shift. Institute staff said the activists would cooperate to destabilize Bangladesh's politics. And they said that in a report to the State Department. Um, so... Uh, this is, uh, again, the International Republican Institute. It's funded by the federal government. It's board. It's like run by Republicans. And um, they receive money, I believe, through the National Endowment of Democracy, which is, you know, how the U.S. Um, puts money into opposition parties and political action um, in countries where they, they don't like the ruling government. Um, so, and again, and they put together a report to the State Department saying that these people that they're working with are going to help destabilize Bangladesh's politics. Um, so again, there, there's lots more details here. Um, that's basically the, the broad strokes of it. Um, and they spent millions of dollars on this. And, and you know, this is going back uh, to 2018, 2019. So it was kind of a long uh, buildup. Uh, so that is it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoint. One from Medea Benjamin and Nicholas J.S. Davies. Biden's Israel policy has led us to the brink of war on Iran. One from William Hartung. The Pentagon goes to school. One from Ted Snyder. Orwell's war when war is the path to peace. One from Karis Michelangelo. Enough already. Stop provoking Russia. And one from Daniel Larison. A, ter a terrible Iran question and two terrible answers about the vice presidential debate.
So go check all that out. Um, sorry if you noticed the show was a little choppy. I, I'm getting coming down with some kind of cold or something, so I had to stop a few times. Um, but uh, anyway, I will. Uh, if you want to support this show, tell your friends about antiwar.com. Like, subscribe, all that stuff helps out. I appreciate everyone who comments on YouTube and Rumble. Um, if you listen to the audio podcast, you could leave a review or rating, depending on where you listen. Um, I will be back tomorrow. One more show this week. Let's hope and pray that things don't get too out of hand. Uh, anyway, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for listening.